Okay. So today I, I have chosen a, a special theme for Dave uh, because he's an interesting card to have here. And uh, this is, uh, you, you know, this is harvest season. Uh, and being harvest season, I want to talk about a farmer, uh, you know, who was, make, you know, walking in his farm and celebrating a bumper harvest uh, because he was, he was going to have. And as he went around, he found three guys arguing. Uh, the first guy, uh, his name was The Sun, okay? And the second guy, the name was Wind, okay? And the third guy, his name was Rain. So they were, they were sort of arguing, you know, who was spread the, the bigger roar in the bumper harvest they were, they were supposed to have. And, and the argument would go like this, and the farmer has come in and he's watching this, they say, the son will say, hey, wait a minute, this bumper harvest that you see here, I'm the one who made it possible. Because all the energy that those seeds and seedlings needed, I provided this, uh, the energy. And then uh, the weed jumped in and said, hey, wait a minute, Mr. Sun, you are never there at night. <laughs> you know? But I've always been there myself. I'm there during the daytime. I'm also during the, uh, I'm there during the nighttime. And I'm the one who actually provides the air and also take away the, uh, the waste from the plant. So if it was not for me, you wouldn't be having this bumper harvest. And then, right then, the, the rain jumped right in. And it's saying, hey, wait a minute, I've never seen any crops growing without water. So I am responsible for this. And then the argument would go on back and forth. And of course, some started blaming one another. And finally, the, the farmer jumped right in. And he said, you know what? All these arguments, I have heard you. But I am the one who provided the seeds. Okay? But it's not about the seeds. We are here to celebrate the bumper harvest that we're supposed to have. So please, let's enjoy the harvest season. Okay? So today, here is the farmer. Okay? So let's... <laughs> <laughs> so 1977, and those of course who've been here for a long time knows that, now they've planted this, the first seeds of what they called the Goddard Laboratory for Atmospheric Sciences. And then of course, through his initiatives going around the country, you know, looking for the best and the brightest, he started making this place. And today, we are all here to enjoy some of his early initiatives. Now, 36 years ago, and also he's going to march forward, backward, so for 70 years, started his career in 1942, and he's going to fill us with a lot of stories, very interesting stories of everything he started. Dave, of course, is a legend, he has so many parents, and uh, published a lot, widely, over almost 300 papers, written books and monographs, so he's actually one of a, a rare kind to have in these seminars, and I was telling somebody that his seminar is, I won't say it's a once in a lifetime kind of event, but it's very difficult to find someone who has been around for 70 years to come and talk about this. So, so it's actually a special, a special thank you. For his well, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> Question, right? It's a delight to be here. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, to see some of the younger people here and some of the older people uh, who are, whom I no longer recognize because they're gray or bald or <laughs> one way or the other. In any case, it's, it's really great to be back here at, at Goddard. So uh, let me get started here because there's a lot to talk about. We'll skip some of the things if time runs out. Um, so this is the way I got uh, the beginning of my career. <laughs> <laughs> and the actual career started when I applied for meteorology in, in uh, December 1942. And I was called to duty in uh, March 8th in 1943. It was at NYU. And I was, it was close to home because I lived in Brooklyn. And I met Lou Batten on the, on the subway, and uh, we, as we, we talked, 
he, I, I recognized his name on the same orders that I had, and we decided to room together. And uh, so, so it, was an, it was an apartment building in which the, uh, civilians were still living. Anyway, here is Lou, who was my roommate. He snored terribly. He was also my best man, and he was the AMS president, among other things, in 1967-68. Um, I'll come back to him later. This is what uh, our education comprised of. There were six months of preparation, pre-meteorology, nine months as an aviation cadet. I was commissioned in June 5th, 1944. The professors there were, among others, were Yale Mintz, Hans Planofsky, Bill Gordon, and Bob Flagel, of whom you must know. Uh, Yale lectured on the old-fashioned uh, climate stuff uh, from Kendrew. We call this Mintz's Magic Lantern Hour, and we, we call, we, most of us slept through uh, his lectures. Uh, and uh, years later, Mintz, uh, the Yale came to Goddard, uh, had worked with Halem, uh, Kalnai, Shukla, and both of the, the latter, Kalnai and Shukla, you know later, received the International Meteorological Prize, which is one of the, the great prizes in meteorology. Uh, I subsequently, uh, without my knowledge, I, I was sent to Harvard and, and uh, MIT to study radar. In fact, radar was so secret at the time that I di really didn't know what I was studying for the first four months. <laughs> the next five months, we were actually working with, with uh, physical radars. Oh, well, the flying division. Uh, the, at, uh, I arrived at Wright Field in May of 1945, and my boss was really a flyboy. He was a lieutenant colonel, and he, he said to me, let's go. I said, Colonel, I'm, I haven't, I haven't uh, used that radar on board the aircraft. In fact, I had only flown once previously. So he said, all right, let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> In any case, uh, he, uh, as we were flying, I noticed I could see the window on the port side, and uh, he feathered an engine, the, the port engine. And I called radar to pilot, radar to pilot, no answer. He then feathered the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and none, it never answered my, my calls on the intercom. I ran up to the, the, <laughs> the, the pilot, and uh, he was sitting there. We're gliding in a B-17, and he's got his, his feet on the controls. Well, he also knew Hollywood stars from USO tours overseas, and so he took us out to Florida, uh, to Hollywood, uh, to test, of all things, windshield wipers. So, and here's one of the people we met. You recognize, if you're young enough, old enough, Clark Gable in the middle, my boss, Colonel Philpott, next to me, and I'm on the right. Uh, okay, uh, at All Weather Flying Division, uh, we were, the community had decided to initiate the thunderstorm project. By that time, Major Joe Fletcher, who was one of the originals in, uh, in the radar, and he was a pilot at the same time. He was my boss, and they took me to, uh, with him to Chicago to uh, talk about uh, the, the thunderstorm project and getting it going. I was really overwhelmed by the, the big guns that were there. Rossby, Bjorkness, Rackelter from Byers, Houghton, Rossgun, Workman, Bemis, Wexler, and Henry Harrison. Decisions were made and I was ordered to go to Orlando, Florida to select the radars for the, the project. I was 21. Uh, the carpe diem, seize the day. The first hurricane occurred while I was down there, and on September 15th, 16th, 1945, I grabbed a camera and a, a crate 
and I took pictures of the scopes of the of the uh, FPS uh, 23, I think it was, MEW radar for about 36 hours without sleep. What happened to those? This is the first hurricane picture. I, there, I took hundreds of these pictures and what would I do with them? As a, like a good second lieutenant, I sent the pictures to the headquarters the Air Weather Service where of all things, Harry Wexler, who was subsequently the the director of research at uh, at the uh, at not NOAA, it was not NOAA till many years later, but he was director of research at the uh, Weather Bureau, and he published the paper with my pictures without any attribution whatsoever. Uh, that will never happen again. <laughs> Uh, here now, one of the things that I was working on at, uh, this is Clinton, Clinton County Air Force Base, and I, we were, there is where we participated in the Thunderstorm project. But my, uh, my work was uh, and aimed, it was aimed at uh, trying to measure rainfall with an X-band radar on the roof of a, of a, a building. And the, uh, on the top here, the, right here, you see a, a storm, the entire outline of the storm in white. And I, I thought and thought about how to do this, uh, how to measure rainfall or the radar reflectivity uh, more simply. And so I, uh, and actual fact, what I did was to, on the bottom you see three cells within the, the outline of the, of the storm. And the boundary of each cell is a contour of reflectivity. That's why it's called iso-echo uh, mapping. Now, the next step is, was an easy one, once color, color, uh, came into use on displays, uh, these things were shown in color, in, in multiple reflectivities. Now at the bottom here you notice that un unfortunately Lou Batten told me this, buyers did not want to take a chance with this approach because none of the, pic so the, the, none of the pictures in the Thunderstorm Project report are quantitative. And it was a, it's a really sad to think that we had the opportunity to measure reflectivities, but Byers was gun shy about trying such a new device. The, well, now you know, the, I, I got a patent in 1953. In those days, uh, civil servers could, could get patents. Uh, I sued RCA and Collins and won in 1958. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and United Airlines began to use the radar in 54. And now you know that all commercial radars and many, many private uh, aircraft use weather radar. So I, st I stayed at the uh, All Weather Flying Division as a civilian until 1948 when I met my wife and I went to Air Force Cambridge Research Labs uh, the, uh, w and I headed the weather radar branch from 1948 to 66. There are a, a couple of people you might know here. The only one that I think you may know is Ed Kessler, who later became the director of the National Severe Storms uh, Center in Norman, Oklahoma. He's still alive. Uh, I'm, I'm over here. And Ralph Donaldson was one of the scientists who with us. This was done at, uh, at Blue Hill Observatory, which was run by uh, Harvard University. Uh, the, the missing from this are Ken Glover, Ken Hardy, and Keith Browning from England, who worked with us for about four years on severe storms. Okay. Uh, I can't go into a great many details about uh, what we did at, at uh, the weather radar branch was that 
Uh, it was a great start with all the World War II radars available uh, to us. And our proximity to Lincoln Labs gave us access to major radars at Truro and uh, Cape Cod, where Ed Kessler and I uh, studied the, the early thunder, uh, hurricanes. We also had a one centimeter radar provided, uh, which provided us with observations of clouds and precip. And the Lincoln later, uh, Doppler radar was on their roof, uh, and it opened the way for us to measure winds. Uh, Roger Lemit and I did that. Uh, Lincoln Laboratory never thought about using using their radar for winds in precip because it was raining outside. Why go up on the roof? Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, in 1964, Lincoln Laboratory did give up the three major radars at Wallops Island, and uh, we were able to get hold of the three radars uh, there <laughs> to study a variety of stuff. And I'll show you a little bit about that, but that was a, a grand coup. Here is one a lightning echo in 1958, which I took from the, uh, ver, uh, the height finder at, at Truro. Um, I'm going to skip this. This, uh, this is a little story about uh, the work at McGill University, which was the forefront, and we participated. Uh, we, in fact, at AFCRL, we were able to support them uh, financially, and we gave them the first CPS-9, and later on we provided the FPS-18 radar, which is still their primary system. This, I, we got them the the radar in 1964, and that it, it remains the primary radar at McGill University. Okay, uh, here I was, uh, I got a postdoc and spent a sabbatical year in England uh, with the team with Frank Ludlam here, who's a professor, Bill Macklin, Keith Browning is over here, my wife Lucille, my daughter Joan, and my son, uh, Bob, and these are the Mossops who had just come, just been married. Uh, and of course, that's the, the sphere with which we calibrated the radars. Uh, this is a remarkable, remarkable piece of work by Browning and Ludlam. This was the woke against storm. We were waiting for a storm. You don't expect thunderstorms in, in England at, almost at any time, but we did get one and we lucked out. Here is a, a, what is amazing about this, this uh, depiction of, of a severe storm is that it was done without any Doppler. No Doppler whatsoever. Keith and Frank Ludlam uh, depicted this. And you could see the, the flow, stre the streamlines, and here is a circulation of a, hail, of a hailstone and a, a possible tornado right, right there. Um, I had great, I learned a great deal from them, and I hope I taught them something as well. Uh, while we were waiting for a thunderstorm to occur, uh, we, uh, we were interested in, in hail. And so uh, the, the two students, uh, Macklin and Browning, uh, got uh, set up with a, a tethered balloon, and we, we made hailstones in tennis balls and melt, let them melt down to various sizes. And so these are this, these are the reflectivities of or cross sections. Here at 10 centimeters, the dots, the dashes are at 4.7 centimeters, and the uh, the solid curve is at three centimeters. And uh, Frank Ludlam and I published this. But what was interesting about this, I sent the observations to Lou Batten at the University of Arizona, and he and Ben Herman were were actually computing the uh, reflect the cross sections of hailstones, and 
I, uh, I said there was no, no email in those days, and so I sent him my first class letter, and uh, this was his reminiscence 27 years later uh, when he was ill. Quote, it was one of the big thrills of my scientific experience when I got your letter in which you had plotted your actual measurements of hail scatter against the curve of the theoretical calculations by Herman and me. I remember thinking to myself, isn't this astounding? Theory and measurement agree. Uh, it was uh, astounding because I didn't think we were, our, our observations were, were that good. Anyway, unfortunately, Lou died just three weeks later. And uh, the, the book, Radar and Meteorology, which uh, was published in 1987, uh, was dedicated to him. Now we, with the, we are now at Doppler at uh, Wallops Island with these three beautiful radars. The bottom one is X-band, X-band, three centimeters. The middle one is 10 centimeters, and the top one is 70 centimeters, all working simultaneously. Now here, the X-band can only detect the, the, cirrus, uh, the cirrus clouds. If we go up here to S-band, what do we see? We see a line of echoes at 12 kilometers, which is the, tro the tropopause. We're now seeing clear air, and up at the top, you can barely see here, the, at 70 centimeters, the tropopause alone. It cannot, the, law, the 70 centimeter system cannot see the, uh, was not sufficiently strong to see the, the ice clouds. Uh, you, you can't imagine how exciting <coughs> those things were. Now we go back to June 1953 when we did an experiment at Buzzards Bay, looking out over the, the bay toward the, toward the east. And we're now, uh, we're now seeing something here at 10,000 feet from us. We had uh, this one and a quarter centimeter radar had only two dishes, one pointing straight out and the other was on the roof of the of the truck that we had. And here at 10,000 feet, we start to see echoes coming in toward the shore. And at the time that they reached the shore, we got the temperature drop, the, uh, the uh, increase in uh, relative humidity. And then we turned to the upper, uh, the upward looking radar. And there we could see the top of the sea breeze at about 1,000 feet. Uh, this was published in uh, just a few years later, but it's, it's still controversial because we, we didn't think uh, that we would see uh, clear air structures uh, at one and a quarter centimeters. Okay, now I've moved to the University of Chicago in 66 and I learned to teach. I really learned more than the students. They can testify to that. <laughs> uh, the NSF, we got an NSF grant for, at that time, for 600K, which, I don't know, it's, <laughs> it's millions today. And we built the, an advanced Doppler radar, which was subsequently moved to uh, Colorado State University, where they're still using it. They've modified it and done a grand job. I, we had five research grants. Uh, and which was which really kept us busy, uh, and uh, I brought Ramesh Srivastava, who turned up as a postdoc from India, and uh, he uh, subsequently rose to full professor and <laughs> retired. Uh, we were then invited to the Naval Electronics Laboratory to use their new FMCW radar and uh, to the University of Wisconsin to join in the use of the over-the-horizon over scatter link. Uh, by the way, it's interesting that so much of our work was, was done by using other people's facilities. Um, okay, so the next one shows me 
uh, at the FMCW radar. The FMCW radar built by uh, at uh, the Naval Electronics Laboratory by Jurgen Richler and his his group. Here is the transmitter antenna and re radar receiver, and here's the guy who's trying to calibrate the radars with a pellet gun. And it worked beautifully, beautifully. I was really, really surprised. In fact, to do quantitative work, you absolutely have to, to get a, 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 a good calibration as we did in, with three radars in England. So, uh, this is one of the things that we saw. We were astounded to see these waves at a height of uh, 200 to 300 meters and growing uh, here to uh, an amplitude of, uh, of about 100, 100 meters. It's only 300 meters above the surface and this of course uh, breaks down and causes turbulence and a diffusion. And of course we've seen much larger waves uh, with intense turbulence at near the tropopause caused by uh, the turbulence and seen by the powerful radars such as those at Wallops Island. Now, okay, uh, now I could stop <laughs> and rest. Uh, no, here is another, this is remarkable because if I've used the, remar the word remarkable, <laughs> it, it is remarkable. I have, I have really been excited by all of the things that we, we saw. But here is the, uh, we took a sounding right at the, at the radar. Here it is, the temperature, uh, here's the base of the inversion at 150 meters. And to buy, lo and behold, I studied this, I, I, I have drawn in these Kelvin Helmholtz waves, uh, where I could see an organized uh, structure. And those waves are only five meters in amplitude. This radar had a resolution, the FMC had a resolution of one meter. One meter. Anyway, the echoes at the top are above the inversion, and they're coming from the land. Those are insects. and. Uh, uh, below you see uh, just one or two uh, insects coming from the ocean. So the air is coming from the ocean and below the inversion and the, the insects are coming from, uh, from the land. In fact, uh, Ian Harris did a paper on, on waves as, as mentioned by the insects. <laughs> okay, here are a few of the professors Joe Podlowski here, Ted Fujita, Larry McGoldrick. In fact, it was uh, Roger Wakimoto who went, subsequently went on and got his PhD under, under uh, uh, Ted Fujita. Of course, there were many other professors. Okay, since I couldn't hold a job, I went to NCAR and I took over the the atmospheric technology uh, division. We built new portable radars, we enhanced the aviation facility, we uh, operated the Palestine, Texas balloon facility, and at that time the computer uh, facility as well, which is subsequently, now we have this major facility up at the University of Wyoming. I said we have, you have. Uh, anyway, in 1975, I, I took over the National Hail Research Experiment, and we were seeding storms with aircraft rockets from below, <coughs> with uh, silver iodide be, uh, being dispersed. There were four years of tests, and no significant results. I propose that we reevaluate our theory and the, our experimental techniques, but there was an advisory committee. They said no. Uh, I took Joanne Simpson to South Africa to view the Hale Research Project uh, down there. Uh, she was very enthusiastic about it, but later, uh, 
analysis by the CSIRO in South Africa showed that they were really faking their results. The, uh, the advisory committee said, we must continue. This is the biggest uh, program of its kind in the world, and the Russians claim that they have had success, so we must follow. The result, I resigned. I was uh, tenured there, so I stayed on doing research uh, on my own interesting things. Here are some of the students that came to NCAR later, and here I'll go from, from left to right, Rit Carbone, Rit Carbone here, your boss, Peter Sildebrand, uh, Dave Johnson, Andy Heimfeld, uh, John McCarthy, uh, Bob Serafin, who was at IIT but was working with us at Chicago, and this, and me, this is me. Uh, we'll see more of uh, this guy later. Uh, well, uh, at this time now, it was uh, 1974, and there, we had hardly uh, had any contacts with the Chinese uh, for about 25 years. Uh, so Dick Reed, who was uh, one of the presidents earlier president before me, uh, wrote to the Chinese and arranged for a trip, which was really fantastic. Here is Bill Kellogg, who's gone. This is Peg Spengler. This is Joan Reed, Dick Reed, Dave Johnson, uh, who was head of Ness, my wife Lucille, and Ken Spengler here at the Great Wall. Uh, now, uh, time moves on, and uh, lo and behold, one of my students, uh, Bob Serafin and Carbone. Serafin became the director of NCAR. Rit Carbone became the director of the uh, technology division. And they did some, they continued a great many of the things that we started. We, had, we built a portable C band, two portable C band uh, radars, uh, which were used by Fujita, Howes, Wakimoto, Carbone. And Fujita had actually used them to discover downbursts. Also, we built the CP2, they built the CP2 polarimetric radar. Bob and Ritt moved to develop the airborne radar system, Eldora. And that has really been a revolutionary uh, scheme. Hildebrand, your boss here, was in charge of the development of, of the system and the leader of the work. And he provided the guidance to the university people who used it. At, a, at the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, uh, they built their own version of Eldora. Uh, and Frank Marx has led, since that time, he's led hundreds of penetrations of hurricanes with their system, which has shown, uh, I think I skipped it. Uh, okay, a little more about NCAR. The uh, research aviation facility got a, so a new aircraft, the Gulfstream G5, and also a C-130, which was able to fly long distances with capabilities for chemistry studies. Uh, recently, there have been new initiatives, and it has been, the bureaucracy has come down on, on them like, they, like it is, has here. Some senior scientists have, were let go and there were no new hires, so that the, sta the staff is top heavy. And there are excessive have micromanagement from Washington. And here is a picture of the dual Doppler system built by, it's, a, it's actually a sketch by uh, AOML. And, uh, here is, it's 19 years ago today, uh, and 19 years ago today, the, the Hurricane Olivia uh, was observed. Oddly enough, there have been no hurricanes on the East Coast to speak about. Okay, 
1975, I was the outgoing president of the AMS, and here are the ten of us. Here's Tom Malone, who just just died a, a month or so ago. Uh, Henry Houghton, Charlie Hosler, Rackel Derfer, Horwitz, Nyberger, me, Will Kellogg, Dave Johnson, uh, Lou Batten, Phil Thompson, and Al Blackadar. Al, uh, all, except for Charlie Hosler here, and Al Block Blackadar and me, uh, the rest of them are gone. Okay, we come to Goddard Space Flight Center, and uh, I was uh, sitting there at NCAR in my little booth, and Bill Nordberg and Director Bob Cooper visited uh, NCAR to recruit me in 76 to establish a broad atmospheric and oceanic laboratory. And well, Bob Cooper said, you can hire without limit. That was unheard of. <laughs> uh, so I, in any case, I accepted and, and went to form GLASS, the Goddard Laboratory for Atmospheric Sciences. Bill Bandine was really the vir virtual head of the uh, what was the Atmospheric and Hydrospheric Atmospheric Labs at that time with 60 plus staff and about 100 contractors. And you had a project scientist, Theon was, was heading Nimbus 5 and 6, Bandine went on to Nimbus G, Arking took over Tyros N, Schenk was leading the synchronous MET satellite, and Bob Kern took care of the radiation budget. It was Morris Tepper who was the headquarters manager, but he had substitutes at, the, at uh, Goddard uh, Building 22, where we had uh, Harry Press and a group who uh, distributed funds to other, other NASA centers. Uh, we had that, that power here, but it disappeared very quickly. Uh, in 1976, while I was doing my own thing at NCAR, Charles Alachi, who is now the director of JPL, called to, for me to, to, to come there to drop a small radar into the Jupiter uh, atmosphere. His, the proposal was ultimately rejected, but meanwhile he showed me an image taken by a synthetic aperture radar on the Convair 990 off the coast of Alaska. It was baffling to him and the staff, and I stayed with him a day, and I, the, although I talked to a lot of people, the image that he showed me was on my mind all day long until the end of the day when I figured out what it was. And here, here is the SAR image from the 990. At the top, we see uh, the uh, clouds are only all up to about three kilometers here, and you see the bright band, the melting level, and the rain below. And this is the ocean, which is, cannot be seen very well. But here are the, the isodops uh, that we computed. Now, ordinarily, the, the SAR is intended to to find, although it has a large vertical beam, it's intended to filter out anything but the zero Doppler, and then, so that they can map the, the ocean surface and the lands. And that is the zero Doppler is right here. But for some reason, the, they were getting uh, the uh, Doppler velocities had moved to the right, and this is zero Doppler now, and when you get down to the melting level where the rain starts, it shifts all the way upstream uh, here so that this is the zero Doppler uh, that, that was uh, seen. The result, the point is that the rain, the rain was uh, causing the, the uh, over here, down here, the rain was causing a, a Doppler signal to 
going down and the winds, the, the wind component coming here had a component toward the, toward the radar. So there was the, the zero Doppler was shifted upstream and quite a way upstream and uh, kilometers, about uh, two and a half kilometers. Uh, it's, it was uh, really fun to do this. Uh, and uh, well, uh, this was done with Marshall Shepard when he was here. Marshall is now the president of the AMS. And uh, there was a storm off the coast of the Carolinas just, just about here. And it left its imprint uh, the, it left its imprint on the ocean using the ERS-1 satellite in, in 1994. And the next slide shows a depiction of how this happens. You see the, the downdraft, the downdraft is bringing uh, the, the uh, southwesterly winds down to the surface and spreads out like this to form a gust front. Uh, actually, in the, actually, when the rain hits the surface, I, you find that the, the rain uh, quiets the ocean. If you've ever been sailing in a rainstorm, you'll notice that the waves are, are uh, reduced as a result of the rain. And that was uh, studied in the 1800s by an English uh, scientist whose name I forget at the moment. Okay, now, as you know, I've done a great deal of work on, on uh, rainfall measurements, and this is a rain parameter diagram. I'm not going to go through the, the details, but here is reflectivity here, and this is rainfall rate. Now, you'd, you'd have to normally, they, uh, well, the, at McGill University, Stuart Marshall had put a, a, a curve through there. But th that, is, that is incorrect. In fact, these lines, the straight lines, are observations, are, are, measure, are median volume diameters. So as you go up here, you go up to about five, five uh, millimeters. And here we have an insert showing that the depolarization, that differential re uh, polarization, going from horizontal, vertical to horizontal, vertical to horizontal, uh, is a measure of the median volume diameter. So that uh, is now we have ZDR, two, uh, differential polarization, we have reflectivity, and so we know D0. And there are other factors in here which uh, are interesting to talk about. Now we come to contrails, and more recently we had uh, Zhen Wang, who's now at the uh, University of Wyoming, and I uh, took these observations. Here, this is MODIS, I don't know if you can see it here, but here is uh, my, my residence, and here is Goddard, and this is where, and uh, the LiDAR is at Goddard. So you, uh, I can barely see it here, but there are eight or nine contrails seen by MODIS. And when they came to, to Goddard, here, they are, here we see the, the same set of contrails. And you see this is the oldest one, is the, it has fallen, so the, the age of these is measured by, by the, their depth. This is uh, really interesting. The, the, the various letters up here correspond to actual aircraft identified by, by us. Here we come to Goddard. Uh, Bob Jastro, uh, who was the GIST director, refused to come to Goddard at the time that we formed. But Halem, Kalanai Shukla, Bob Atlas, and Yale Mintz do. And they formed the global simulation and, and oh, uh, modeling ac activity. Um, okay, uh, we recruited Joanne to, to Goddard in 1979 after a lot of interference from headquarters who, who claimed that they, they had the hiring capabilities. 
She took over the Severe Storms Branch later and the Tropical Rain Measuring Mission and did a magnificent job. I spoke to her uh, when she was dying at the, at the hospital and I guess I was the last friend to speak to her. And by 1980 we had hired 35 new staff and 15 more offers were made uh, until Reagan, Professor, uh, President Reagan froze the hiring with Joanne Simpson North, King, Parkinson, Uccellini, Ben Chandler, and existing staff like Menegui, Zwali, and so much more, Glass was really jumping. We had great support from directors Tom Young, Noel Hinners, and John Townsend. In fact, I used to play tennis with Noel Hinners and, and uh, my boss here, Meredith. Uh, this is a lightning echo seen in Brazil by, and we published this uh, up. Uh, here is, here is a Doppler radar, 950 megahertz, uh, up here in Brazil. And so the, these, the, these echoes are, are going up and these are coming down. And you'll notice that there's a very wide spectrum of velocities here, which either means changes in updraft or downdraft. And so the, there are collisions between the, the various particles, ice particles of different size, Graupel and ice crystals in particular, and that causes the lightning here, and the lightning echo here. This is 20 meters per second down and about eight to 10 meters per second up. So we're talking about a, a breadth, a tremendous breadth of velocity, which uh, works okay. I retired in 1984 and I joined the JPL as a visiting scientist uh, for two months per year. And Franco welcomed me as a visiting scientist here. And here are our first three directors. Uh, my, uh, Franco and Marvin Geller, and he was my student and your boss, uh, Peter. And here are some of the big guys, Milt Halem, uh, Bill Lau sitting right in front here, T Ted, uh, uh, Bob Cahalan, who's going to speak at uh, Riderwood, where I live. Uh, and, uh, Wiscombe, you're there, <laughs> and uh, Franco and me. So, uh, unfortunately, NASA took over the management role and divided each discipline into subspecialties under control of program managers, some of whom ruled autocratically and knew little. <laughs> uh, each specialty was defined by an R top. And I supposedly had 20% flexibility, but even that little bit was micromanaged. The consequences were that the scientists bypassed me and went directly to headquarters. What a way to run a ship. We had a joint meeting with Noah Ness on the measurement of, of rain from space at which we formulated a program. And these, this was... Uh, Eckerman, Meneghini, and myself, and later the uh, details were, uh, were set by the Jerry North and others. Uh, through personal contact with a Japanese colleague uh, at a uh, 1983 meeting with Kenji Nakamura, avoiding formal contact with NASA headquarters who, who would not have approved of what I was doing, I suggested a joint program with them which would start with NASA flights of their dual wavelength radars. Both of them, Nakamura and Toshi Gozu, joined us and we, this ultimately led to TRIM. Uh, the results that it took 14 more years to plan and build TRIM uh, jointly and launch it from Japan in 1997. And, uh, the, uh, in fact, it's really amazing that TRIM is still performing reasonably well. And the importance of precip measurements, of course, has led to the GPM, which should be launched. Can somebody tell me? 
February. February? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll be around. <laughs> and my final remarks, I really had uh, remarkable opportunities in every period of my career. I owe this to uh, symbiotic relationships with my colleagues, most of whom I've mentioned here. I was trained in two disciplines, which is really a critical factor, and had supportive organizations. I've grabbed the day, carpe diem, when serendipitous opportunities came my way. My enthusiasm was boundless, although it sometimes worked counter my, to my intentions. But every endeavor was exciting, whether it was my own or that of my colleagues. An outstanding example is the development of Modus by Mike King and the book that he and Claire Parkinson wrote. And there's so many more of you here whom I can't mention. Uh, looking back, I can't imagine the progress that we've all made in the last 70 years. I wish you all great fun and satisfaction in our endeavors in the years ahead. My wife, Lucille, who could, couldn't be here today, I can't thank her enough for sharing in all my ventures. She is really the cause of, of our life. And thank you all. Tomorrow, actually, it's a big day for him also with his wife. They are celebrating 65 anniversary of their wedding. So let's give him a round of applause. Congratulations. Good job. Good job. So, floor is open for comments. Please. Yep. Hey, Ava, Brian, you didn't mention this, but I'd be curious to know how many journal papers you ended up with and which one do you consider the most uh, important? Uh. You can go to Google Scholar. <laughs> I don't know why I expected something from Andy Negri. <laughs> That's, uh, oh, yes. Anyway, it's, I, th I thank you all for, for coming. It was really a, a distinct pleasure for me, and I, I have very fond memories of this place and of the people who've made it work. <laughs>